Well, everybody, welcome. This is a joy for us. This is um, an expansion and an extension of what we've been doing for many years now, and we couldn't be more happy with our first guests. But before I have them introduced, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you all for supporting this wonderful organization. I mean, are we not lucky? This, this beautiful space and endless opportunities that are brought at our feet, uh, we, we just couldn't be more lucky. Especially somebody like me who grew up in the Bronx and ended up in a cabin in Yellowstone. Um, it, and, it's kind of, and lives here in Kennesaw, so it was an interesting meld. But we are having many programs coming up, and we've expanded our leadership group. Everybody knows Mike Strickland, who's up in the control booth. He's our IT. And you all know Maria, who's our program person. Jim is our hospitality, and he's not here right now, so he usually does a better job of making you all feel welcome. I am the taskmaster uh, and the border collie. Uh, I just keep everybody in line um, and oversee. And so, uh, Maria, can you come down? I want you to give a little, little heads up about what's coming. Again, thank you all for being here. And uh, Maria's gonna give you some idea of what we have in the future. At the end of the program, we'll have a question and answers. All right. Hey, everybody. <laughs> I'm Maria Valorak, um, and I am the volunteer with Palma, Jim, and Mike. And uh, I kind of get programs going, things lined up throughout the year. Um, Palma asked me to let you know what's coming, so here's a look. Um, Obviously, tonight we have the Portrait Society of Atlanta panel discussion, which we are very happy to have here. Thank you all so much. Um, March 14th will be uh, Kathy Anderson, and she's going to do a, a demo and a talk. Uh, April 11th will be um, Aida from Multimedia Art Board, and she's going to be talking about the importance of different surfaces, and she's going to bring art boards with her to sell and she's going to have a healthy discount so you don't want to miss that and apparently she also has brushes too so she's going to be bringing her brushes her panels and giving a good talk on that um, may 9th we had a last minute cancellation i'm not even sure all of my um, leadership colleagues know this uh, we had uh, Barbara Ratner, who is a retired architect and plein air painter she had to cancel at the last minute um, and she's now moved to August. So we actually have an opening for the May 9th meeting. If anybody's interested in talking on a particular subject, let me know. Um, you can tell we all are passionate about art and everything related to it. So don't be shy. This is a good opportunity to practice your skills if you're interested. Um, and then in June, we have a sculptor talking, Michael Naranjo, and I'm sorry I don't have my glasses on, so I'm trying to make this big. Um, and then in July, you know, we have no meetings. So we take January and July off to give people a break for the holidays and the summer holidays. Uh, but then we'll come back in with August and we'll have Barbara Ratner, the retired architect. Um, September 12th is Chris Groves. And October 10th, Michelle Byrne. Uh, November 14th, we, we have uh, Brenda, Pinnock. Brenda Pinnock. Yes, thank you. And December 12th, Clayton Beck. So um, that's the lineup for the year. And as you can see, it's fluid. It changes. Things yeah. come up in people's lives, and we change. Um, so really, if you're interested in talking, please, please, please consider giving a talk. We all are interested. We all want to hear what artists have to say. All right? Thanks, everyone. Do you want to introduce that? Oh, yes, yes, fine. yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought you were coming back up to do that. Um, okay, it, it's with my pleasure that I do get to introduce to you representatives from the Portrait Society of Atlanta. And um, we talked about the importance of self-portraits and they're going to have a, a panel discussion to help us understand why that is so critical during these times in particular. Um, if you've never done a portrait, that's okay. Um, they're going to talk a little bit about 
how to get started on that and what you need to do. But don't worry, this promises to be a very stimulating discussion. And you can see by the number of people we have here, I think we have a lot of people interested in portrait artists. So I, Holly, I will ask you maybe to come up and give the introduction, or you don't have to come up, just introduce your colleagues. And thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. Good evening. My name is Holly Henson, and on behalf of the Portrait Society of Atlanta, I'd like to thank you for having us here tonight and for coming to this program. We have chosen the topic of self-portraits for this event. And before we dive into the presentations and look at some artwork, I'd like to share with you why we chose this topic. The mission of the Portrait Society of Atlanta is to promote public awareness of portraits as a valid and valuable art form. And we wanted to explore the art of the self-portrait as a uniquely evocative window into that. It's a form of art that is rich, layered, historically significant, and immensely personal. It can be deeply psychological while also being extremely practical. The practice of creating self-portraits can be challenging on many levels, yet it can also be nurturing. As such, it's often a catalyst for experimentation and growth as artists and as humans. Tonight, we have a few of our members here to share some of their own reflections on the art of self-portraiture. In our short time tonight, we know we can barely scratch the surface because the more one delves into this topic, the more it expands. While we are not art historians, we are portrait artists and art lovers. So we will share some of our favorite artists and examples of this art form, as well as our own self-portrait journeys. We hope this will give you inspiration, ideas, and something to reflect on as you return to your own studios and easels and sketchbooks. And we hope you will go home and create your own self-portraits, because it is in your studios that the real struggle and the real magic happens. And now I'd like to introduce the artists with the Portrait Society of Atlanta who have worked to prepare this program. First, you will hear from Jennifer Stallone Riddell. Jennifer has been an active member and volunteer since 2018. She has studied with or been mentored by many of the greatest contemporary artists in their fields, such as Juliette Aristides, John DeMartin, Dan Thompson, and Dylan Pierce. Jennifer's work over the years ranges in media from watercolor to oil paint, focusing on dry media more recently. She is passionate about portraiture and the figure. Her work has been recognized by juried competitions locally, nationally, and internationally. Jennifer currently has a figurative work appearing as a finalist in the Best of Drawing magazine's Stroke of Genius annual competition. Second, you'll hear from me, I have been a member and volunteer for eight years and I currently serve as first vice president. I've been painting for close to 30 years and have a great passion for working with oil paint. Most recently, I've been experimenting with and working on a copper surface. Over the years, I have studied with a number of master artists working in representational oil painting, most notably Stephen Assail, Steve Forster, and Katie Whipple. My favorite subject matter is people, although I have a great passion for painting animals, particularly birds. Next, we have Nancy Honey. Nancy has always connected with creating. This has been her enduring path in life since the age of five, when she began drawing and painting with private instruction. As a lifelong learner, her art training with selected teachers has brought her joy, knowledge, and skill. For over 50 years, Nancy has enjoyed a successful career in art, specializing in the portrait. As a teacher, her love of empowering the serious student has compelled her to share the knowledge she has accumulated. A charter member of the Portrait Society of Atlanta since its founding in 1979, Nancy has served as president and just about every other job over the years. For over 25 years, it has been her privilege to serve on the advisory board as an essential guide to the organization. 
Wrapping us up will be Ruby Mason. Ruby has been a member of the Portrait Society of Atlanta for six years and is currently serving as exhibitions chair and second vice president. She studies figure drawing and portraiture working in charcoal, pencil, and oils. I'd also like to introduce you to Margaret Ann Garrett. Margaret, where are you? Can you stand up? <laughs> Margaret has been helping on the back end tonight with the presentation planning and putting together the PowerPoint. She has been a member for about 10 years and has served as editor of our magazine, Folio. Margaret is also a past president of the Portrait Society of Atlanta. Additionally, we'd like to thank Mike Strickland, Maria Valarac, Palma Rhodes, the Booth Artist Guild president for the invitation, and thank you to Lindsay LaCroix for the audiovisual assistance here at the theater. And now I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Da Vinci, Van Gogh, Sargent, Gustav Klimt, Picasso. You need to only scratch the surface and you will find the self-portrait drawings in the collections of many of the most celebrated artists of all time. What does that tell us? First, compared to painting, drawing tends to be a quicker process it requires little preparation, depending how sharp you like your tools, and an artist needs to only think about line and value, not hue and chroma. The reasons for self-portraiture are numerous, but surely one reason that drove many of the drawings you will see in the presentation will be that self-portraits, when done from life, are an opportunity to explore a long pose for free, as long as the artist has the time, patience, or sanity for it. The finer point of a pen or pencil demands a high degree of specificity. It pushes the artist to go deeper with their understanding, digging into facial anatomy, rhythms, and the finest nuances of expression. Take, for example, this Rembrandt self-portrait drawing, employing his brilliant use of hatchmark. Hatchmark, or cross-hatching, is a technique which was first invented by engravers that describes the form using strokes or lines drawn in parallel or axially. When you think of exquisite line work, Nikolai Fetchin springs to mind, his command of facial anatomy combined with exacting precision and expressive mark making is pure genius. One of the very first avid practitioners of the self-portrait was the German Renaissance artist Albrecht Dürer. He had an unquenchable thirst for demystifying and understanding the natural world around him by drawing it. Shifting his focus onto himself, he produced this iconic study for the painting Self-Portrait with Flower. It not only shows the arresting directness of his gaze, which was highly unusual at the time, but the drawing exemplifies his characteristic bold and dynamic hatch mark in order to understand every undulation and edge. I was lucky enough to see it back in 2018 at the Metropolitan. You might say it's my selfie of his self-portrait. <laughs> I couldn't find a preliminary drawing for this next one, but how could I not mention one of the most beloved American self-portraits by one of the best draftsmen of all time, and one of only three self-portraits that the shy Norman Rockwell produced, his humorous and multi-layered triple self-portrait. Clearly having fun with the setup of this self-portrait, it's a technical tour de force, mystifying viewers at the time. It is a self-portrait within a self-portrait within a self-portrait. In this photo, Rockwell revealed how he went about creating the work. The actual self-portrait that was done from a mirror is not shown in the mirror depicted in the painting. But beyond the ingenious setup, he perfectly illustrates the struggle of self-evaluation while creating a self-portrait and describes it so humbly when he explained why his glasses looked opaque. Quote, I had to show that my glasses were fogged and that I couldn't actually see what I looked like, a homely lanky fellow. 
and therefore I could stretch the truth just a bit and paint myself looking more suave and debonair than I actually am. Switching gears to an artist who was perhaps never accused of looking at herself through fogged glasses, the great Kathy Kolwitz. She created more than 100 self-portraits in her lifetime and is celebrated for her unique style, merging expressionism and realism. After losing her, after losing her son in the First World War and becoming more politically active during World War II, her self-portraits become increasingly expressive, more melancholic, even unflattering. In a diary entry from 1917, she clearly embraced and practiced what she preached. Don't hide yourself, she said. Be the person you are and find your essence. She showed us exactly who she was without any sugarcoating. This tortured work demonstrates her dramatic mark making, conjuring strong emotion while still acknowledging bony landmarks and facial rhythms. Here is a head study by John DeMartin, one of the leading figurative artists today, phenomenal teacher, and author of one of my absolute favorite books on drawing, Drawing Atelier. I had the honor of taking several workshops with John, and I asked him, before I took on the challenge of a self-portrait, what he would recommend to improve my skills. He suggested that drawing from a cast was a surefire way to hone one's power of observation. This elegant drawing was an integral part of the planning for his painting, Faith in the Wilderness, to which he attributes the quote from Hebrews chapter 11, now faith is being sure what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. A powerful piece using self-portrait to create a compelling narrative. I started talking about self-portrait drawings as a quicker means of study or to be used as a foundational piece in a more complex narrative painting. While they possess a tactile intimacy and beauty in their own right, I would be remiss not to mention some contemporary artists who are eschewing the fast and furious capability of the medium. Embracing more elaborate approaches when creating their self-portraits and fully intending for them to be standalone finished works of art, their methodology often uses many layers or mixing media, resulting in dramatic atmospheric effects. Shane Wolf, Amaya Gurpiti, Camille Corey, The late Susan Houtman heavily relied on dry media to relay her artistic statement. This self-portrait is by the contemporary draftsman Gabriella Handel. I had the chance to correspond with Gabriella before this talk to get her own thoughts on her self-portrait philosophy as well as on a specific series. From Panama originally, Gabriella said when she first moved to New York in 2013 as a graduate student at the New York Academy of Art, she made many self-portraits. They served as a tangible manifestation of her lifelong dream. Fast forward to 2017, and we have the daring use of self-portraiture in her series as a victim. I asked Gabriella if she could share any insights for us about this strikingly powerful work. They took a year to create, she said, from conception to execution, and they were a quest to face her fears, an interpretation of her personal experiences, not a direct translation. Thankfully, she was never in these exact terrible circumstances. Gabriella stressed this because many viewers find themselves overcome by waves of sympathy for her or assigning a kind of Me Too ideology. The fact is she sees this series as a reflection of her personal journey and ultimately hopes viewers can move past their initial pity. She concluded if the work is good, it should transcend the artist's original intention and that is what makes artwork timeless its visual quality. Quote, that means that future people won't care about my stupid experiences and will be able to appreciate the drawings for their composition, charcoal manipulation, the portraits, and the hands. Undeniably, this is an example of self-portraiture working on multiple and some very challenging levels. My next spotlighted artist, as it happens, taught Gabriella at the New York Academy of Art. Among the many institutions he has taught at, Dan Thompson has been at the forefront of the figurative and portrait resurgence for over two decades, not only creating award-winning artwork, but sharing his vast encyclopedic knowledge and unique revelations. 
I've had the privilege of attending a number of his mind-expanding workshops over the years and had the special opportunity to chat with him before tonight's event. Together, we looked at the multicolored chalk self-portrait from 2017, and Dan walked me through the conceptual as well as the technical progression. When asked what was crossing his mind when he was creating this piece, he answered, what is the expression of creativity? What is the expression of one's own face when you are not conscious of being photographed? When he looked away from the mirror, he thought about what does it feel like to make something? He said, we don't really have a creative expression in our arsenal of facial expressions. For some people, the look might be angry or lively. For another, it could be peaceful, meditative, or happy. He began with an approach that he described as open-ended, exploratory, comparing it to open doorways. He said he didn't want to fully realize at this stage, since it allows him to see the iterations of his expressions. Dan then added more black chalk to punch the contrast, allowing him to play with marks of emphasis and de-emphasis, affording him opportunities to develop pieces of form and rhythm. He noted the complex mouth region. As the portrait starts to formulate itself and feel more like a statement, he began to modify the black and red chalk with yellow chalk. That, combined with the blue paper, provided enhanced chroma and served to heighten the warm and cool tones throughout the face. Dan then went into the background using vine charcoal. This allows it to fall back into space, taking away the blue, forcing the hue to be under the color of the face exclusively. Dan went on to address the eyes. He said they are wet and very reflective. They are like a mirror in and of themselves. There's a creative opportunity through the highlight that isn't possible with a photograph, he said. A tighter highlight, for example, gives you a more concentrated look. He explained the scale of the highlight within the eye gives you a focusing capacity. Where you place the highlight allows you to set the feel of the room. Moving the highlight provides a wide range of theme and variation, enabling the artist to shift expression and feeling. In this portrait, Dan depicted himself as a glow in a dark room for his highlight. Here we have his silver point self-portrait from 2013. He said, with this medium, one needs to focus on osteology, raw bone structure. You cannot blend in silver point, so there's a delicate linear quality. For this self-portrait in graphite, Dan used a double mirror, which he described as a fascinating exercise because you are seeing yourself the way others see you. He explained further, normally when we look at ourselves in one mirror, we bring with it image baggage, he called it. We have a residual self-image that includes distortions that we have made so we can live with them. However, in a double mirror portrait, we are flipping the script, allowing the artist to see all the wonderful imperfections. And while Dan wished he could change some things, he couldn't. So he put them in, and that is what this portrait meant to him. Eye Against Eye is a painting that explores the confrontational nature of a self-portrait. It was not all about peace and love, not by a long shot, he said. At that time, Dan used a kebab skewer for measuring, which he tried to position like a sword, because there is something about fighting yourself in a self-portrait. This award-winning oil painting from 2001 called Dreams and Nightmares documents the pivotal moment Dan decided it was time to venture into professional practice. After 11 years of full-time education, the toil of such intensive study comes with perpetual and severe self-criticism. In the art business, he said, nobody tells you when you're ready. You have to tell yourself. The title aptly alludes not only to the dreams or aspirations of that venture, but also the inner turmoil Dan grappled with. So the nightmares denote the self-doubt that he had to wrestle with and overcome in order to make that leap. And thank goodness for us, he took that leap. The self-portrait can bolster your understanding of the face's physiognomy. It can serve as a public or private recording of a moment in your life. But whether it's a practice in catharsis or education or both, the self-portrait is a truly remarkable artistic genre. I hope these images and artists have been as inspiring to you as they have been to me. And seeing spellbinding self-portraits is what initially planted the seed to take on the challenge myself. And that leads me to the odyssey that was my own self-portrait. 
The year is 2020. We were all there. We all share the strange bond that is unspoken, but implicitly understood, having lived through a global traumatic event. And the directive to hunker down and isolate spawned many self-portraits during that time. But despite my self-portrait being created then, I was driven by the sudden passing of my father. Two weeks before lockdown, we lost him. It wasn't as though I felt a glorious surge of creative energy to embark upon my first proper self-portrait, but I made an internal vow to express my love and memorialize my father the only way I knew how. And I was far too raw to draw a portrait of him directly. My mother had given me his favorite sweater, worn through at the elbows, still smelling of his aftershave. I draped it over my shoulders, allowing myself to feel the comfort of his presence, imagining his warm embrace holding me up and carrying me through. I considered how I would pose, how much to angle my body in the mirror, and I knew that I wanted to hold his sweater with my hand over my heart. It was, after all, my pledge to try to honor him. Looking at oneself to draw as objectively as possible is necessary, but for this portrait, it granted me the chance to look at my reflection and see my father's likeness in me. My mother has been compared to movie stars and models, and so all my life I would hold dear any similarity to her I could find. But during the creation of the self-portrait, with each new anatomical discovery, I felt a new level of bonding with my dad, as if I had the honor of carrying the genetic torch and being that little bit closer to him if I could clearly recognize the bits of my face that originally belonged to him. It was such a gift to be able to feel my love for him through the prominence of my own temporal ridge. The moment I decided it was finished was when I finally made peace with the fact that even though it could never live up to the abstract notion of a perfect tribute to my father, I had given it my all. It truly felt like I had crawled over a finish line. When there was a call for entries for the Portrait Society of Atlanta's fall exhibition several months later, I figured it was perhaps the only chance to symbolically verify the pledge I made to my dad, so I summoned up the courage and submitted it. The competition was juried by the phenomenal artist Lewis Carr, and the drawing was given a merit award. I was moved to tears for the honor and for the recognition of something so close to my heart. Today just so happens to be the fourth anniversary of my dad's passing. I'm grateful to be here with you all tonight, sharing my story and my dear father's memory. Thank you. Tonight I'm going to share images of self-portraits from a few of my favorite historical and contemporary artists. So much could be said about each of these artists and their work, but the one common thread I'd like to tug tonight is their use of expressive and painterly mark making and the unique resulting surface quality and texture they have achieved through that expression. I tend to think of it as their artistic DNA. And I invite you to think about your own unique mark-making tendencies and patterns, your artistic DNA. No matter what level of skill or experience we each currently have as artists, we are all here in part because we share a passion for making marks. And as we experiment with our materials and push our boundaries through practice, our mark-making vocabulary expands in ways we couldn't have imagined. Our artistic DNA finds new modes of expression. The personal and intimate act of creating a self-portrait can offer a special opportunity to do just that. Some of these artists work exclusively from life, and some use photography as reference tools. Some use both. This gives us various examples for setup when we approach a self-portrait in our own studios. And once we commit to a self-portrait project, we can choose to let go of external and even internal expectations, to shake up our typical way of working and take risks in a relatively non-threatening way. It's a chance to step outside of our comfort zone and both challenge and nourish ourselves as artists at the same time. Now, no discussion on self-portraiture would be complete without a look at a Rembrandt or two. 
So let's start with this example from the master. He painted this tiny piece when he was 24 years old. It's only about five by six inches. Rembrandt was known to have painted five artworks on copper panels in his lifetime, three of which are on a gold leaf ground. This is one of them. The broken brushwork is applied in such a way that the underlayers and gilding are still visible, and the marks follow the form of his face, breathing life into his expression. It appears that Rembrandt created this little self-portrait as a study for two subsequent paintings, created on the same type of experimental gilded copper surface. So here is an example of the master, Rembrandt, expanding his artistic toolkit and pushing his own creative development by experimenting with a self-portrait. Vincent van Gogh. Such expressive mark-making and emotive use of color. Vincent was my first love in art. He was always learning and always challenging himself. One important way he worked on building his skills and developing the style we know him so well for was by painting himself. Most of his self-portraits were made in the span of just a few years. When he was living in Paris, it was practical for one thing. He was short on money, and using a mirror, he became his own free model. Many of his self-portraits were painted on the back of other paintings as an additional way of saving money. To him, this was an artistic practice. His end goal was learning and improving his technique and portrait painting skills so he could take on commissions. And to us, it's a gift. Now let's turn to some contemporary work. My favorite artist of all time is Stephen Assail. Stephen was born in 1957 and is a native New Yorker where he continues to live, work, and teach. The first time I saw Stephen's artwork was at an exhibit at a contemporary art gallery in Atlanta about 20 years ago. It was pre-social media. I was not familiar with him or his work and I had zero expectations. I was stunned. The exquisite level of skill executed in these paintings harkened back to another time. Yet his sitters were completely modern. I could sense such deep empathy and tenderness in these paintings. Years later, I had a chance to study with Stephen in person where I discovered he was really one of the kindest individuals I'd ever met. He has created many self-portraits over his long career. Stephen paints and, and draws from life or imagination almost exclusively, and he is completely in the moment when he is working. Listening to him talk about working from life, it's as though he's describing a spiritual practice. In his own words, he says, as individuals, we are incredibly unique, and there's something miraculous about that. He goes on to describe painting as a collection of individual moments that woven together become an organic connection. Stephen's process is not predictable or singular. Sometimes he's throwing or vigorously flicking paint at the surface with his brush. His models have been known to show up in raincoats. Sometimes he's applying oil paint from a myriad of saturated pigments with one of the many soft fan brushes from his arsenal. Sometimes he's carving marks into hair or finessing glazes with the most delicate of touches. He describes his process as a way of holding on to something that is fleeting and temporary. This collection of experiences or moments becomes something tangible, he says. Quoting Stephen again, the thing we are left with begins to feel like a relic. It's a series of selected marks that are connected to a true and believable experience. To me, Stephen seems to approach oil painting as though he is sculpting. As a result, his finished paintings are these highly textured, encrusted jewels. He builds up his surfaces with a furious intensity, scrapes marks away, and builds them up again in a way that simultaneously reveals his own artistic DNA and seems to capture something beyond likeness, the soul of the subject. And responding to the particular, he creates something universal. Stephen began drawing from life when he was a little boy. 
He has numerous self-portraits that date back to when he was a teenager. During this time, he was using himself as a model with the intention of studying the old masters. Now in his late 60s, he continues to create new self-portraits. Working from life, he uses a mirror to the side of his easel and lights both himself and the surface with the same source. He experiments extensively with metals as surfaces, which add further to the jewel-like quality of his work. Stephen paints on copper frequently, and sometimes he first tones his copper panels with chemicals, as you can see here. In this very recent self-portrait example, he painted on toned silver mounted onto a gold leaf panel. Seeing a portrait Stephen painted on copper in 2016 was the catalyst for my interest in trying copper as a surface. But outside of his methods and his mastery of his materials, it's his spiritual approach to painting from life and being fully in the moment with every brushstroke that moves me the most. Let's pivot now and look at another contemporary painter who creates masterful and moving self-portraits, typically working on a large scale and including reference photography as a tool in her process. This is the work of Alyssa Monks. Alyssa was born in 1977 and lives and works in Brooklyn. Here is what she says about her process. My intention is to transfer the intimacy and vulnerability of my human experience into a painted surface. I like mine to be as intimate as possible, each brushstroke like a fossil, recording every gesture and decision. I love this quote because it demonstrates how the self-portrait is both in the artwork as an image and also in the hand of the artist along that journey. This is a recent self-portrait of Alyssa's that is currently on display in her two-person show at Forum Gallery in New York City. Here is another large-scale painting from the same show entitled A Tune. I think Alyssa's use of oil paint is just so luscious. Here's how she describes it. It's so uncontrollable and unpredictable. There seem to be endless ways to use it after 30 years of experience. She continues, there is just so much possibility with this medium, richness, versatility, complexity, thick, thin, transparent, impasto, warm, cool, scraping, pulling, stretching, layering. You can see some of her gorgeous brushwork and the abstract quality of the details in her paintings from this small piece from 2020 entitled Entropy. It's only four inches by four inches. Alyssa says, I try to use as many different techniques in one painting as I know. This kind of approach can create a feeling of turmoil or stress or weathering or delicate fragility in the paint. I love it. I try not to be predictable or formulaic. I think this adds a human touch to the work. The result is a history of decisions and choices made by the human being, not an algorithm or machine. I try to embrace this and push this as far as possible. Alyssa uses reference photos as tools for creating her work. She also encourages training yourself to go beyond the reference photo. In her work, replicating the photo is not the end goal. She explains that a photo can help us create an interesting composition or inspire our palette choices, but there's so much it cannot tell us. For example, where to use texture or how to treat edges. Her paintings may use photos as tools, but her paint application is unpredictable and unique to each moment. This powerful self-portrait from 2019 is entitled, Roar. This haunting piece, entitled Scream 2, is another stunning example of the emotive quality of her self-portraits. Additionally, it demonstrates yet another notable aspect of her work, painting people in water. In her unique and masterful way, 
Alyssa demonstrates how expanding your use of paint or materials contributes to the unexpected textures and marks that create the whole. While she manipulates her tools to form magnificent images, she's paradox paradoxically letting go of control and allowing all of the pushing and pulling of paint to become a thing all of its own. Finally, I'd like to enjoy some self-portraits together from Austin-based artist and teacher Jennifer Balkan. Jennifer uses paint and Posca markers in an exquisite, juicy, and expressive way. She is a master with bold color and gorgeous surface texture, and she holds it all together with her highly disciplined approach to values. Jennifer is very transparent on social media about the struggle of creating portrait art. She creates her deeply psychological work both from life and at times with the aid of photography. Sometimes on Instagram, she will share her reference photos side by side with a finished painting so you can see some of the choices she has made along the way in creating the artwork. Interestingly, Jennifer doesn't often refer to them as self-portraits, but tends to say she's modeling for herself. Another nod to the practicality of creating self-portraits. Nonetheless, over the years, Jennifer has created a prolific body of ambitious and triumphant self-portrait art. In this detail of her painting home, we can see just how delicious Jennifer's application of oil paint actually is. This last example is the most recent self-portrait of Jennifer's that I've chosen. It demonstrates her current fascination with Posca markers and her versatility with mixed media choices. She's also including acrylic and spray paint in this work. The final painting I'd like to share is a self-portrait I created last year. It's part of my continued exploration with oil paint on a copper surface, and it was born of my desire to improve my life painting skills. When I attend model sessions, I usually only have three hours to work from the model, and then it's over. But I was craving the opportunity to have multiple sessions with the model, and sitting for myself provided a way to do this. I wanted to allow the paint to dry before each session, because the experience of painting on copper changes dramatically as the surface begins to build. Therefore, intentionally spacing out sessions provided some unique opportunities to explore what is possible with this medium and this surface. Also, I normally start my commissioned portraits by creating a tight preliminary drawing and then transferring it to a linen panel right. or a copper panel. But in this case, this painting was just for me, and the pressure of getting an exact likeness was diffused. I felt free to challenge myself by working in a sculptural and structural manner. I gave up the drawing phase altogether and started very loosely, making adjustments and corrections with paint as I progressed. Regarding my setup, I used a mirror to the left of my easel. The light in my studio comes from a north-facing window, but it's a low light, and I have the challenge of ambient lighting drifting in from the other side. So I decided to allow for this softer lighting effect instead of trying to control it. One of the many things I learned from creating this is that sometimes it's useful to not overthink it, especially if that's preventing you from getting started at all, which is often the case with me. Your studio may not be exactly as you wish, your light may not be exactly the way you'd want it. Mine wasn't. You might not be caffeinated enough. I never am. But begin anyway, and then keep going. Good evening, 
It's good to see all of you, even though I can't actually see you because of the lights. My presentation invites you to think about ways of employing the self-portrait to enhance your creativity. Here are some ideas. The self-portrait can be a visual journal. Perhaps you might set out to do one each day in an hour or however long you'd like to spend for some number of days and evaluate your revelations. You may write along as you draw or after you draw, keeping it a visual journal and a written journal. The self-portrait can be used to affirm and honor yourself. It can be used to do grief work and to help heal, as we have heard tonight. It can be used in a journey of self-acceptance. It can be used to celebrate joy. The self-portrait can allow you to explore materials or surfaces and to experiment perhaps with color or composition. And it can definitely be used to study anatomy. Our most fundamental searching as human beings is to make sense of the world around us. We assign meaning to objects, color, shapes, words, body movements, tones of voices, sounds, smells, and events. This process of assigning meaning helps us to make sense of, to organize, to enjoy, and to remember. And we often assign those, we often represent those assigned meanings with symbols. Developing your personal symbolic language is a process that takes time. We can use our self-portrait to explore and develop our language as it affords us a model whenever we want, giving us all the time we may need. As we think about symbolic language, we begin to realize this subject is very broad. Symbolic language can be objects collected for their personal meaning. On the other hand, it can be more abstract, such as a color that has symbolic meaning to the artist, such as black or red. It may be a group of colors that convey, conveys personal feelings, such as harmony or discord. Your personal symbolic language might be brushstrokes, such as used by Sargent or Van Gogh. We may we think of how abstract artists use shapes to convey meaning. Symbolic language can be shapes. Here we see how Gustav Klimt, and we're going to see a close-up, used rectangles and circles as symbols for male and female among his many other shapes. Symbolic language can even be expressive lines, which means something other than description when used in repetition or in particular rhythms, such as this one by Nikolai Feshin, charcoal drawing that is full of his personal lines and unique mark making. Size can be used to indicate a personal message, such as the oversized flowers painted by Georgia O'Keeffe. Size is a major part of Italian art made of tiny mosaic pieces. And in the paintings of Chuck Close, size is a major part of his symbolic language as he used a grid of symbols to create his oversized portraits. Today we find symbols all around us printed on money, signs, advertising, logos, and even our numbers and words are symbols. Symbols are so pervasive, we sometimes do not pay attention to them. As artists, we might want to narrow this down to our own personal visual symbolic language. How can we get started? By employing a few simple practices. You can dedicate focused thought toward discovering your personal symbols. Perhaps start a journal of your symbols and their assigned meanings. You can observe your past work, looking for symbols you may already be using unconsciously and develop them. Once you recognize and identify your personal symbols, you can, be used, you can begin to use them repeatedly in your work. Now I will share with you the work of two artists as examples of the self-portrait using personal symbolic language. 
Nelson Shanks is recognized as one of America's premier realistic painters and portraitist to international leaders and celebrities. He was a major proponent of classical realism. Oops, sorry. They'll be next. He was my teacher and became the main influence in my artistic growth. I had the privilege to study with him and his teachers, often on for 20 years. A generous teacher, he constantly challenged his students to grow. His knowledge, teaching, and friendship inspired my artistic life. Tonight, I have the honor of sharing two important self-portraits and a few figurative paintings that use his personal language with symbolic with symbols. In this 1987 self-portrait, painted at the age of 50, we see Nelson as a confident artist, busy at work in his studio. Behind him is a painting from his Renaissance art collection and a few art materials. However, the primary focus is on him. The space between the viewer and Nelson is quite close. He has created tension by placing himself at the edge of the canvas. And we have interrupted his concentration on the canvas. He looks at us intensely, redirecting the energy that had been going towards his painting. The mirror he uses is near his left shoulder. His choice of a torn denim jacket further contributes to the message of work. Nelson's self-portrait is all about work, determination, and discipline. He painted every day of his life except when he traveled. This 1987 self-portrait does not yet fully express the sophisticated color relationships that Nelson would develop and become recognized for in his mature work. During the 18 years between this self-portrait and the next figurative painting we see, he developed his own symbolic color language. He became recognized as a color master for orchestrating amazing harmonies of hue and temperature and achieving color intensity rarely seen in classical realism. You can see the evidence of this color language in this painting, Persona, 2005. You also see his symbolic lang language using objects, many objects. In addition to his extensive collection of 15th, 17th century paintings and sculpture, Nelson also collected random objects which had personal significance. One or two of these objects often appeared in his figurative paintings, never in his portraits. However, in persona, we see many of these objects together. During my studio visit, when he was painting Persona, I asked him, why are all these objects together? He said they all had meaning to him and re represented some aspect of himself, hence his title, Persona. In the next few four detail images, you'll be able to see the objects more clearly. So take a look at how they're composed. And you'll see these objects repeated in the next painting. You'll see this little oriental guy. Now we visit Nelson's figurative painting, Salome. So they told me there's a laser. There he is. And there's a mask that's in the other painting, another mask, a food dog, and this purse that's embroidered and sequined. I don't think he ever used it for anything but this painting. When I came in and saw this painting in the studio, it was a tour de force figurative painting. As I stood before it in his studio, I experienced a powerful performance of theater. It was stunning. Drawing closer, I remember to the painting, I remember moving very closely across the painting, taking in the visual delights. Nelson's color language was magnificent. 
the brilliant complex composition weaving his symbolic language of figure, objects, textures, and surface changes definitely intrigued me and held my attention. His handling of edges was visual poetry. He just stood quietly watching me, enjoying my engagement. It was a privileged studio visit to remember forever. <clears throat> In the next image, we see Nelson's figurative painting, Audience. As I enjoy the exquisitive play of light as color, I also found, find humor imagining the model Eden in conversation with the objects. So I'm going to show you a close-up so you can see the repeat of some of the objects from the earlier painting. You see a different arrangement of some of the same objects used in Persona and Salome. Part of the beauty of developing a symbolic language is the opportunity to use it again and again in various ways to make different statements and to deepen the meaning of your creations. The next image shows Nelson's self-portrait, Two Old Goats, completed in 2014, a year before he passed away. It was painted 28 years and thousands of paintings after the 1987 denim jacket self-portrait. Once again, he is using a mirror, but this time you see his reflection inside the mirror. The goat's skull placed in the foreground is more prominent than his own image. You can see his command of color and edges as he conveys the space between the goat skull, his reflection in the mirror, and the space in the room beyond. He even conveys the slight distortion an image in a mirror reflects. Although we see his image on the canvas in front of our eyes, we can imagine him standing beside us or behind us as if we were there looking at the skull with him. A masterfully conceived cell portrait, it is expertly painted and displays his fully developed symbolic language. Now let's look at the second artist whose images I bring to you. Leona Shanks, wife of Nelson, is an amazing painter, has a degree in sculpture, studied painting with Nelson for many years, co-founded Studio and Kaminati with Nelson, and is a core teacher at school. The self-portrait by Loyana Shanks is titled The Guardian. I feel this portrait expresses her trust and faith in an inner strength and wisdom, which allows her to go forth fearlessly into the world, expressing her ideas and developing her personal symbolic language. I was visiting her in the studio during the time she was painting this. The owl was hung from the ceiling by many wires. It was always there, waiting for her, a symbol of strength and protection. Each day she stepped in place under it and stood in front of the easel and mirror to paint. There. This powerful self-portrait uses haunting personal symbolic language. This next image is a later self-portrait by Leona Shanks. It is a simple, direct statement of a confident artist. She uses her personal language of color. It shows acceptance of oneself and embracing one's power. It seems to say simply with conviction, I am here. The next image, Nelson titled this painting Oracle. Ah, uh, Leona titled this painting Oracle. It shows the development of her language of color and the use of objects as personal symbols to convey her intent. It is strong and demanding. The message of the oracle must be heard. I like following oracle with this next painting. Oops, what happened to the next painting? Whoops, okay. What happened to Blind Justice? There it is. Okay, I like following... It was probably my fingers that did that. 
I like following Oracle with this next painting, Blind Justice by Leona. It shows her personal color language used more subtly, more quietly, but still intensely, in a sophisticated arrangement of hues, temperatures, values, and edges. The beauty of light as it plays across forms and the subtle color harmonies draw me into this shallow space, and I reside here to contemplate. There is a clarity that conveys to me a quiet yet personal lament for the lack of justice. There it is. So in 2003, Nelson Shanks, along with Leona Shanks, founded the vibrant Studio in Cominati School for Contemporary Art. It is a very special atelier-style teaching program in Philadelphia. It offers a four-year comprehensive program like no other, as well as workshops. Over the years, Nelson accumulated an extensive museum-quality collection of Italian Baroque paintings and sculpture, which included a rare Anibale Caracci painting. He loved this period in art. Visiting his home and studio was like going through a portal in time, walking into the Renaissance. It was transcendent and sublime. He named his school in Cominati, after the academy founded by the Caracci family in Bologna, Italy, in the 1500s. Incominati means to progress or to walk forward. So we were asked to present some of our self-portraits. In this early 1970s watercolor self-portrait, I created it's called Looking In, Looking Out. It comes from a period of my artistic life when I was exploring concepts and using the self-portrait to do that. In this one, I explored the design concept of formal balance with variation. I was also, obviously, exploring chaos and order. It was fun to allow it to evolve. My symbolic language was just emerging in the use of my favorite earrings and my grandmother's handheld wooden mirror. I don't know if you can see. I think you can. The reason that it's looking out is that center mirror, there's a face. And the eyes in the real people are vacant. But the eyes in the mirror are there. Anyway, it was fun. And so your, your self-portraits can be fun. Uh, in this next image, why is it this? Maybe I have to hold it up here. This image is my self-portrait study in Silver Point. I brought it here tonight. It was done to explore materials. After seeing some Silver Point work at a museum, I was intrigued with the delicacy of the drawing and the process. I read everything I could find about it. One day, I felt an urgency to explore the Silver Point process. I'm telling you about this because one day, you may feel an urgency and don't let anything get in your way. I quickly prepared a board with gesso, grabbed some of my sterling silver wire used in jewelry making, stuck the wire into a big click pencil, and began. The immediacy of using myself as a ready model served me well. I had read that drawing with the silver wire was a delicate process, but having loved drawing and graphite for years, it seemed to me it felt just the same. But I became too energetic and bold and gouged out some of the surface. Seems it is, after all, a delicate process. It was just an experiment to learn about the process, so I continued and finished the drawing. The silver particles deposited on the surface will oxidize over time when subjected to the air. But as you know, that day, I wanted to see it right then. I set up a Ziploc bag sized to fit my drawing, placed two boiled egg yolks into the bag, knowing that the sulfur would quickly oxidize the silver. It was so exciting, like watching a Polaroid develop over a few hours. The lines turned from faint gray, very faint gray, to a warm, slightly golden as they developed a patina. It was satisfying. However, I would not recommend that you try that. But you can, if you want to, because it was fun. So this next one is a self-portrait study, My Voice, using dry media, and it is a celebration. 
It is done in the drawing process I currently use. This process began to appear before my eyes one day in a drawing session with the model. It was a surprising gift and very rewarding. It seemed like my voice had finally sprung forth. With so many teachers in my heads, so many teachers' voices in my heads from years of extensive training since the age of five and 45 years working with portrait clients, I always yearned for my own voice to emerge. This intuitive drawing process seems to be a uniting of many different ways I perceive and the various approaches I have used to draw and paint over the years. So I guess I had to work through all those years before it came together in this drawing. However, I will tell you one other little thing I didn't write. I did it last night, and I was pretty tired from getting everything together, and I was laying down and resting and really wanting to do a drawing that was more current. And so I just picked up a tablet and graphite while I was laying there and thought, I'll just draw myself lying down because artists throughout time have drawn people lying down. But it didn't work quite as well because your face kind of slides back. I mean, it could have been a drawing of someone lying down, but when I felt better, I stood up and did it in a mirror. So I hope this has inspired you to attempt a self-portrait if you have not done one. If you have already done one, I hope it will empower you to explore new ways to use the self-portrait to explore your personal symbolic language. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ruby Mason, and I'm going to share a little bit about the Portrait Society of Atlanta with you. Um, oh, sorry. Can you hear me all right? Um, in 1979, a woman named Anna Norris uh, knew of a portrait club in New York City where artists got together and shared information and she decided that she would create one for Atlanta so that's what she did in 1979 and this is one of the very first meetings uh, in her living room today the Portrait Society of Atlanta holds two juried exhibitions each year artists from all over the United States and uh, other countries even uh, enter their work. Our most recent exhibition in, the, at, in Alpharetta uh, was held um, in Alpharetta and included artist work from New Zealand, New York, California, and um, other places around the country in addition to local Georgia artists. We also hold five annual meetings um, where both members and visitors are welcome to come together Highly acclaimed portrait artists come and do demonstrations. Um, that's a common thing to see. They answer questions. Uh, the meeting topics vary, uh, but the common thread is the artists coming together to share and learn from each other and make new friends. Oh. Well, not sure what I did there. Um, Let me see. Hmm? Try going back. Um, oh. Ruby, stop clicking for a minute, please. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> this is my uh, first clicking uh, event. <laughs> well, anyway, in addition to our exhibitions and our meetings, oh, there we go, um, we have... Uh, we have critiques, we also have um, workshops and life studio modeling weekends. I would like to sum up what our organization is all about with two simple phrases. Uh, one being, uh, number one, being learning and growing together. Whether you're coming into uh, a demonstration from a, from a professional or uh, talking with another artist that you share a desire to study in the same way or see art in the same way. Um, the Portrait Society of Atlanta is all about learning and growing together and that is the primary focus of what we do. 
Um, the second is uh, the celebration of portrait art and the artists who create them. So I'd like to share some of our members' por self-portraits with you. This is Maria Andrea. Anne Aspen. Mike Butler. Rosie Coleman. Margaret Ann Garrett. She was the one telling me to stop clicking. Um, Margaret is our previous president and uh, worked behind the scenes tirelessly for this presentation. So she's very helpful. Cheryl Mann Hardin. Teresa Harris. Holly Ray Henson, a different self-portrait. Nancy Honey, another familiar face. David Hines, interesting viewpoint. Ted Landers. Bailin Liao. Katie Leo. This is Don Meadows. He's the uh, second from the left. He's actually our cur current uh, president of our association. And he's here with us tonight, out there somewhere. Laura Murphy. This is Anna Norris, our founder's uh, self-portrait. And it's in person right here. I hope you'll have a chance to come up and look at it in person. It uh, has a different viewpoint up close. Hope you can come and see it. Shiva Niyayapathy. This is uh, Jennifer Stallone Riddell's. Um, she has a little note here for us. Here is a self-portrait as a work in progress at a stage when I am working on planes of the face and their relationship to each other and at the very beginning of thinking about the broader forms of the face within those planes. Interesting to see at this viewpoint, at this vantage. Gail Tate. Rajita Tipavachala. I had to ask her how to pronounce her name. I <laughs> practiced that one. <laughs> Susan Duke Waters. Susan's note. I love to garden almost as much as I love to paint. After a bout of pulling and planting, I feel invigorated, composed, and complete. Not so my hair, hedge combed and crowned with an array of debris, I'm a sight. Yet happy from the garden, I am unfazed and entertained myself with the notion that such twiggy characters were pleased with their efforts too. This is Mike Wimmer's uh, self-portraits through the years. He's done a workshop for us. And this is Mike's uh, most recent self-portrait at the easel. And now moving on, I'd like to open up the floor for discussion. If you have any questions or comment, please raise your hand. And if you are viewing from, yes, Palma. Uh, my question is about using copper as a medium to paint on. Especially here in the South, things take so long to dry. Does that affect the drying time? Because I have a piece that I got from somebody in Taos that they painted on metal, and it took months for it to dry. Does that affect 
Because you said you waited for it to dry to come back on it. That, That's for you, Holly. Do you facilitate the drying process? What do you do? So what, what I found with copper, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I don't know what metal that piece is on from towels. My experience with copper is tends to be the opposite of that. I find that it dries quickly, very quickly, um, or you know it it sets up really quickly. So I use um, lead white in my under paintings. And you can actually uh, prime copper with a thin layer of lead white if you want to do something like that. A lot of people choose to do it that way, and that'll give it some tooth, and it dries very quickly. And I've tried that before, um, but I kind of prefer to go onto it like a slick surface. It's just you're just like ice skating on it at mm -hmm. first, and the complete loss of control. But if I have a little lead white in my mixtures. Um, it bonds to the copper, and then it starts to, to oxidize quite quickly. I mean, I haven't done like a scientific experiment for this. I should s preface with that. This isn't a scientific study. It's just my, you know, my experience in my studio. I feel like things dry faster on copper than they do on linen. And then I can go back, and the paint is really, like I could go back the next day, and it maybe wouldn't be fully oxidized, but the paint is ready to grab another layer at that point. Um, so I, it's, it's faster to me. So different metals absorb moisture differently. It, well, is that what you're learning? It doesn't, there, since it's an oil-based, since I'm using an oil-based paint, um, the, there's a bonding that takes place between the oil paint and the metal surfaced. And it, it doesn't absorb it at all, really. That's one of the things I love about painting on copper is that everything just sits there. And the pigments don't sink in, so they stay very enamel and jewel-like. Um, you're not wondering, like, where did that dark color go that was so beautiful yesterday? It's still there, and it's still shining. Um, but it, it doesn't, there's no sinking in at all. It just sits right there on the surface. And, but it, but it does, there is a type of, some type of chemical bond that takes place between the copper metal and the paint, particularly with lead, that is, creates a really strong type of bond. Yeah, but it's worth experimenting. How do you buy it? In sheets or? I, um, I use, I have two sources that I use. One is um, a company that, a small company that makes surfaces for artists. Um, it's artifacts and they are in California. And th they are copper composite panels. They've already been polished. You know, you could just go paint, you can go paint right on them. Um, and then there's an aluminum backing and there may be, I can't remember, there might be some type of core in between. But they're really um, beautifully done. And um, I know Raymar also makes a copper panel too. Uh, but I also buy copper panels, small ones, if I want to work really small, from K&S Metals. And those are like etching plates. And they, have a, they still have like a really high gloss to them. So you can prep them if you want to. But uh, sometimes I like to deal with kind of the, the struggle of the paint really sliding around a lot at first because you have so much glow from the copper that comes through at the end. Um, and those, those are the two I use. There, there are other good ones out there, too. Sounds fascinating. I'm waiting to try it. Can I take some questions from the audience? Emma, I know you know. You want to know more than you know. That's why you're here. What about portrait society? I heard you say Alpharetta for your last one, and then uh, I live in Marietta, and I remember one time it was there. How do you, how do you, about your meetings and your shows, do they all move around? Or how, how no, we have a meeting place. Uh, Yeah, uh, the question was uh, the meetings and the uh, exhibitions moving around. Our exhibitions move around always. We have two a year. Um, the meetings, we have a mo meeting place. Uh, what is it called? It's on off Old Shal Shaliford. 
It's mm -hmm. the uh, Dunwoody area, and we meet always meet there. Yeah, it's on our website. It's always the same place. Anybody else? Questions? Yes, sir. How does one uh, become a member of the Poker Society of Atlanta? See, and do you need to submit work uh, to be jury? Okay, to become a member, uh, just go to our website and you can sign up online. Uh, do not need to show artwork. Um, anyone can become a member. We have members from um, all different levels. We have experts, obviously, and we have novices. So um, there's full range. And for the exhibitions, they're juried. You would uh, enter your work, and it's always done online as well. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Some of our, um, the, uh, just a adding a point that some of our exhibitions are members only, our upcoming spring exhibition is members only, and then some of them are open to members and non-members. So it'll say that on the website. So I was going to add, if you if you are interested in uh, the Poetry Society of Atlanta, I do hope you will go to our website and... Um, check it out, show up at one of our meetings or an event. There are actually a number of artists on our, uh, that are members of our, uh, our group that are also members of the Booth Artist Guild. So you'll see some familiar faces too. Thank you for the question. Excuse me, the question is, what is Silver Point? Yeah. Was it to me? How do you do it? Is it on? Yeah. Oh, well, you can go and buy expense. It used to be very difficult to find equipment and uh, silver wire and all the different things that you need for it. But it's become so popular in the last 20, 30 years that uh, a lot of people are using it. And so, of course, the manufacturers and the uh, people who sell it are on it and so you can find it and you could do what I did as an experiment to see if you like the process before you invest in the real equipment the holder for the wire the wire the boards you know that are prepared to accept the particles of silver wire um, I just figured gesso would work so I gessoed it and it did because it it needs to be a soft sterling silver wire that will offset the particles onto the surface. And it worked. But it was very, it's very faint. It's, it's like working with a very hard graphite, fine, a fine lead graphite. Well, depending. And the, uh, there's another thing that's interesting you could explore if you like to experiment. And you could do this also with silver wire from Hobby Lobby. But they, um, have it locked up now, so because so you have to ask for it, and they didn't even know they had it, but years ago I knew I'd bought it there. So, um, but they do have it, and it comes in different gauges, and so the wire for jewelry making is thin, and it and the numbers go down, so 14 is thicker than 22, and so you could experiment with different sizes of wire as well, therefore having different uh, line quality. Uh, the tricky thing about it and the reason, and when you go up close to that, um, it's not a commission piece, so I don't care if you see my mistake, so you'll see it. It's uh, gouged out all the way down there, and uh, because once it started gouging, <laughs> more gouged out, and so uh, I think the surface, therefore, is quite important that it's bonded correctly, and maybe just so is not quite the right surface. But if you just want to experiment with the whole process before you invest, you could. And um, the, the difficulty and the delicacy comes from the fact that the wire has, the point of the wire has some ragged edges to it. Unless you sand, so I sanded after the gouge event I sanded down the wire with um, a nail file, which did no good, 
and then I found, found a metal file and I just, you know, abraded it a little bit to make it a little rounder so that would not happen in the entire drawing. And so that's the, so it seems that dragging it towards you is the safest. When you push it away, it digs in like you're removing tile off the floor with a tool and it goes like that. And so I think that, you know, making your lines or your dots or whatever you're doing, dashes and coming towards you seems to be more effective. Um, when I brought it in particular because I wanted you to see, it's a warm light here, so I'm not sure how it's going to actually show how the patina is so beautiful on it. And the ones that I had seen in the museum had that patina and it's like, what is that, that golden line work? What did they use? And that's what it was. And so, you know, if you're patient, you can wait for it, however many, six months, whatever, for it to patina, but I wasn't. So I stuck it. I stuck it. I like that. I knew that the egg yolk produced sulfur and it would quickly do it. And it did. And it was fun. Oh, yes. Um, well, I tried working with it just with my fingers, but that didn't work so good. So I, I, I love my favorite, um, oh, sorry, my favorite graphite is, again, when I want to just do it, is a big click pencil, and I can just do so much with that graphite. I have every other pencil imaginable, but, you know, sets and sets of them, but that's my go-to pencil, so I always, always had it. So, um, you know, I just took the lead out and stuck the wire in there. And as I recall, because it was done in 2008, it, it wiggled a little bit. So I just put tape around it to hold it. I mean, you know, when you're experimenting, you improvise. Because if, if your impetus for doing something is to know, like I'm driven by curiosity, then if you don't feed that right away, you'll be curious about something else and you'll never find out. And so that's where the urgency comes from, um, for, for me. So what, I will say a little thing, it's not about self-portrait, but it's about uh, being able to actually work uh, because from a lifetime of working, sometimes I get blocked and I love process, so I listen to process of writers, musicians, actors, dancers, all kinds of people with their creative process. And this one man said that he wanted to write but it was so intimidating to go into his office. So he began to keep a tablet everywhere he sat. Everywhere he sat with a pencil. And so I thought, well, I'm going to do that. So I have that. And that's why when I was laying down last night, I just reached over and picked up a tablet and the pencil and started. And so therefore I did a drawing. If I had waited to feel better, I probably wouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, www.portraitsocietyofatlanta.org. Are there any more questions? More questions? I think that uh, we really have to be thankful for this group that have enlightened us and educated us, and uh, we're all going to go get some silver wire. Uh, <laughs> Did you have any Zoom questions? Go back hundreds of years. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to our guests. I think our meeting is going to be adjourned. You, are Can, more questions from Zoom? We're done here. Any more questions? Can I just... Yes, um, can I just say on behalf of the Portrait Society of Atlanta, thank, thank you for having us here this evening. Um, it's been a lovely evening and a pleasure. So thank you so much. <laughs>